821, Big 550, KTRS. Just uh, moving on from that sad news, the passing of uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch sports columnist Brian Burwell. Um, we now turn our attention to Brad Garrett, ABC News crime and terrorism consultant. Uh, Brad Garrett, good morning this morning. Good morning, McGraw. So you're an FBI, former FBI man, and you probably have quite a number of interesting takes on what has transpired over the last couple of weeks with the police trying to uh, arrest Michael Brown and now this incident in uh, New York. First, let's take the Michael Brown situation here in Ferguson. What are your thoughts as you sit and you watch that debate go on nationally? Well, a number of things come to mind, McGraw, is that every time you have an incident like the Brown-Wilson situation in Ferguson, it really goes to what is your relationship with the community? Because that's what kicks in. Now, obviously, the police had a big issue or does have a big issue. They don't really represent, from an ethnic standpoint, the population. You know, have they really connected through civic leaders, even gang members, activists? All of that takes a lot of energy. But that's when when something goes bad, it's those relationships that step in and help you mediate problems. And that's not to say that Ferguson wouldn't have gotten out of hand, but I, I'm, more, I'm convinced that maybe not to the degree that it did. I keep hearing that, and, and, and I know enough of the police and have been on enough ride-alongs and sort of watched this, that police, they can always do better. But I've heard that from police for the last 20 years, that part of being a good police officer is knowing your community right. and not just being there when the store is robbed, but being there on a Tuesday when you get a, a failing grade or when the bus doesn't show up and you're having a conversation and you, and you drive the person to work and that's sort of community policing. So that's, it's, this is not something new and, and police have been not. trying to do that for the last 20, 30 years. Correct. That, that is exactly right. Some communities do it better than others. You know, one thing, McGraw, from a historic standpoint, is when we, we went to patrol cars instead of walking a beat, right. uh, it created a problem because it's a barrier. Now, you know, urban is, there's a lot of reasons why you have police cars and moving around, but you still have to have that connect, connection. You have to get out of that car. You have to move around. You have to understand people. And you also have to train officers to have at least a level of empathy, even with bad guys. That doesn't mean that they should have let, for example, Eric Garner continue on. But could you have stopped? He wasn't armed. He hadn't committed a violent act. Have a supervisor step in and say, step away from him for a second and try to talk to him like you would at a hostage barricade. Try to de-escalate him before it became, because you become, in effect, part of the escalation. Uh, easier said than done. We, we weren't there. And, and I've been in those situations where people didn't want to be arrested. But you've got to, you have to be the cooler head. Is, is this not a, a, a hindsight's 2020? Because there's that story where the, the police officer says, well, I, I thought I was choking him, so I let up on him, and then he pulled a gun out of his pants and then shot me. Well, yes. But you didn't have any indication that that was going on in this case. I think what you had was a well-intentioned officer who used a hold he shouldn't have used, but he did the, you know, the absolute critical thing of not letting go. In other words, are there neck takedowns? There are, but you don't stay in that position. Uh, and that's what, that's what got him into trouble. And my guess is it's going to cause him big problems keeping his job and big problems in civil court. Yeah, th that's a good point. And this is an interesting thing to, to note. He was found that he didn't do anything criminally wrong. Right. However, his job is going to tell him that he did a lot wrong. It, it, and they have said that from the get-go. Both the police commissioner and the mayor have said, this is illegal. We don't do it. We don't train it. Officers aren't allowed to do it. And he, clearly on video, he's doing it. And there, there were so many other officers around him, too, that you would think, you know, they would kind of, I know it all happened so quickly, but you would think they would kind of help try to de-escalate that and say, hey, you know, let up on him. When people go into crisis, they get tunnel vision, and officers are not excluded from that. The whole goal was to arrest him. When, when he resisted, they increased their level of, of trying to take him down. Now, that's okay to a certain extent, but you've got to figure out some alternative if it's not working. And clearly, if someone's saying to you, I can't breathe, I mean, you know, you have to listen to that. Particularly, I think somebody said he said it 11 times. That's a big problem. 
because no matter what he did, there's no justification for you further harming him unless he's trying to trying to hurt you in a, in a, in a rather significant way, like with a knife or a gun, which does not appear to be the case in that situation. He was known by the police because he says, hey, you're not going to arrest me this time. He's been arrested 31 times before. Right. Right. He was well known selling these Lucy's on the street. Right. Um, so he resisted arrest. Michael Brown resisted arrest. If both of these did not resist arrest, would they be alive today? It, quite possibly. And going to your scenario in Ferguson, I think, McGraw, y you do have to question why did Wilson get out of the car uh, and pursue the guy alone? It's one thing to have other people with you, but the idea that you would, and again, we're sort of doing the, the, the 2020 thing here, right. but but it is something to think about. And because he was asked it, I think ABC asked him that. And he said, you know, that's part of my job was, is to continue on. Well, you only do that if you think somebody is an absolute threat to the community. Are they going to harm somebody? And there really wasn't that dynamic. He got into it with the officer, obviously. The officer felt threatened. I think there's some reality there. But that left. He ran away. So, you know, the question is, would he still be alive if, if, if Wilson hadn't pursued him? Maybe. Right. Or he could have gone after another officer and gotten shot by somebody else pursuing him. It's hard to say. Well, but if someone's willing to go after your gun in your holster and try and, you know, and they got two shots off in the car, uh, if he's going to go after a police officer's gun, he'll do just about anything. Well, that is correct. That, that is correct. So... I'm not going to fault Wilson for going after him. I'm the only suggesting you need to think about those things. It's, it, going back to my phrase, you've got to be the cooler head. Yeah. All right, Brad Garrett, ABC News, uh, crime and terrorism consultant, always the cooler head. Brad, be, be safe. Thanks for checking in. Okay, McGraw. 830, Big 550.